Welcome to Conversations That Count. Thank you for joining us this evening. I am Sri Lekha Pale, Fairfax GOP Vice Chair of Strategy and Engagement. Our goal through these conversations is to bring in candidates that are running for primaries so you can get to know them better and also learn about the issues that they care about. This is the best time for you to join in in the conversations by putting your comments in the Facebook live chat or even asking questions to your candidates, the issues that matter to you. Please note that 11th District the Congressional Convention for Republicans and Firehouse Primary is on Saturday, May 7th. I'll try to get to as many questions as you can, as long as you start engaging by putting your comments in Facebook Live. Continue to support these conversational sessions by subscribing to Fairfax GOP Facebook page. Now let's get to know our today's candidate. It is my most pleasure to introduce Barbara Banks. Ms. Banks was raised in Pennsylvania in a very small town to a hardworking and patriot family. She's a self-published author, a USAF Lieutenant Colonel retired with 27 years of combined active and reserve service and Department of Defense employee. She's retired there. She was commissioned as a second lieutenant and entered a du active duty with the 35th Tactical Fighter Wing, George AFP. She served as uh, an avionics maintenance officer for four years. She has a lot of credits. We just really need to get into those conversations to speak to her about all the accomplishments that she has had in her life. She's married also to a USA uh, fighter pilot who is now retired and co-built with her husband a home-built aircraft, a varies. I hope I'm saying it right, Barbara. I would love to hear more about all your accomplishments in um, as being a lieutenant colonel. Barbara, welcome to Conversations That Count. Thank you. It's good to be with you. Thank you. Barbara, you came from a small town that mostly has a young of uh, World War II veteran families. It's my understanding that your dad was also the vice president of town council at the time of death in 1998 and was a World War uh, Navy veteran. Is that where your interest in politics came from? Ta talk to us more about that. Actually, no, um, I was interested in, in uh, politics in college. I was had a pre-law curriculum. And um, at the time um, I actually, uh, looked up courses about the military because most people on Capitol Hill didn't have military experience. And uh, it turned out uh, it was an Air Force ROTC course that I signed up to take um, to learn about um, aeronautics. And um, uh, it was through my dad's World War II experiences in the Navy, he would tell me stories when I was in high school. And then when I got into college, when I was pre-law, um, I always was interested in running for Congress. So it was sort of a combined thing. That's, that's very good to know. Barbara, how long have you been living in Levanth District? Uh, we came here in 1992. So oh. Virginia feels like home to me. Um, I've lived here in Virginia longer than I have in Pennsylvania when I was growing up. Yeah. So uh, Barbara, I always tell that the more you live in the community, the more you understand the issues that, and concerns that you have at your residence. I, I reviewed your website uh, to kind of understand your background and trying to understand the issues that you picked. Uh, did you pick the issues based on your interest on based on an assumption that what 11th Congressional District constituents would like to know, or did you pick issues based on surveying your own community members? Um, basically, I... I have been in military intelligence my entire life. And when we came to Washington, DC, I worked for the federal government. So I'm very attuned to national issues. And I got um, a master's in public affairs and I also have a master's in finance. So I'm aware of um, uh, capital investments from Wall Street uh, as well as large corporations. And so I just keep up with national news. And these topics I believe are just not particular to the district per se. I think it's uh, common across the United States, just common worries about the inflation, national security, um, defense, uh, immigration, um, things like that. So while we here in the district are so close to Washington, DC, um, that um, 
a lot of these things are just common across the states. Yeah, that's good to know, Barbara. I always say Washington DC issues are national issues. Right. I mean, we are the hub of the politics, right? Barbara, mm -hmm. while I was doing my introduction, I don't think I, do, I did a great justice because I didn't talk a lot about your military intelligence officer work and so on and so forth. I would love to know your uh, fighter bomber mission, those, uh, and I think our viewers will be very interested in knowing that oh. part of your career. Would you mind elaborating mm -hmm. on that? No, well, actually, I went to the University of Pittsburgh for two years, and um, at the time, I found going to a large university in the city just very hectic. Um, there was a six-lane highway on each side of the main part of campus, so before I knew it, every day just flew by, and I did not like that environment for studying, and, and um, I actually worked my way through school, so for the first year, I worked full-time during the daytime, and went to school uh, full-time at night. Um, in my second year was when I entertained the idea of learning more about the military and I got introduced to Air Force ROTC. Um, it was during that time um, that I had met some graduate students and one had transferred from the University of Texas in Austin. And I realized that I could afford to pay the out-of-state tuition, which is not much more than my in-state in Pennsylvania. So they actually helped me to transfer and I actually went to ROTC summer camp in Alabama en route to transferring universities. When I was down there, um, I completed my studies, but the, the first year I was down there, I thought, well, if I'm going to be in the Air Force, I need to understand flying and aviation. So the ROTC unit um, taught a ground school. And so I took ground school. And then that following summer that I was down there, I actually went out to the small airport and uh, went to a small aerial service and got my private pilot's license. It was during that time um, that the ROTC unit would take uh, cadets out to Bergstrom Air Force Base, which was not far from downtown Austin. And the pilot that I flew with is now my husband. Um, it turned out that um, we flew for two and a half hours and um, I did not run into him again until um, nine months later at an air show. And I thought I recognized him and I stopped him. And uh, it was shortly thereafter that we started dating. And um, uh, he had just returned from Vietnam. He was flying, um, he went to Korea and then his unit transferred to Thailand. And uh, so he uh, had just returned and was reassigned to Bergstrom flying the O2s. And uh, so once I graduated, um, he was due for a transfer and uh, we both got married, and that's when I went into avionics maintenance. And the interesting thing about my career is when we got to George Air Force Base, I was actually assigned um, to the avionics maintenance squadron. They had 500 people, and there were only five officers. And I was only one of five female officers on the entire base. Um, there weren't many women on active duty at that time. And um, I had some very sharp troops working for me. There were many people that worked in the, the avionic shops that had been in Korea at the time my husband was there. And uh, he had an accident um, up there and they were very familiar with the accident that happened. Um, but um, so it's interesting how um, uh, life can have its circles, you know, people can connect. But uh, what's interesting is I learned what it took for avionics to be repaired on the aircraft. So I knew, um, what my husband was flying. And then when I uh, cross-trained into military intelligence, I actually knew the threat. I knew the, the weapon systems that he was flying up against. So we made for a very unique couple. Absolutely, Barbara, that is extremely interesting. I know you have two beautiful daughters and I, I, I'm sure they learned a lot from both of you. I personally don't, don't come from military or Navy family, but I have humongous respect for what you guys do. And I think living in Washington DC area, I've encountered many of you. And I think each of you are very unique, not only in your skill set, but also very patriotic. So that kind of draws me yes. towards all of you. So uh, thank you for serving our nation. I, we appreciate that very much. So Barbara, moving on to, I think another issue you chose is securing our borders, Southern border by building the wall. You know, but you also talked about develop, developing a plan to reverse current immigration patterns, right? We, you wanted to make sure there is orderly deportation procedures. 
And also you spoke a little bit about established country or quota system based. I'm an immigrant, as you know, my husband mm -hmm. came on H4B. I came in on, uh, I'm sorry, he came in on H1B, which is a working visa. I came in on a dependent visa immediately, got my um, H1B and green card and there you go. So I'm curious to know, are you proposing that we need to reassess this H1B visa program? Or are you proposing that uh, oh, you got to create some kind of um, pause on the visa program? Because this is, uh, one of the topic that gets discussed a lot in immigrant immigrant community and your 11th congressional district does have a lot of immigrants so i'm kind of uh, curious to know um, what are your proposals and also not to lengthen the questions but also i think this is an issue that must be solved but our politicians can come together to solve the issue so what do you think is going on well i think you need to go back um through our history, because back in the late 1900s, when our economy was transitioning from an agricultural economy to um, an industrial economy, um, a lot of people came in primarily from Europe and um, there was a quota system. And when the people came in, um, they got to work. They had to work um, to support themselves. And um, in fact, many people were turned away for diseases or any other issues. Um, I've looked back through our immigration policies historically, and at various times, various criteria had been introduced. Um, there were quotas depending on certain countries that people would come in from. Um, there, there, uh, some people would only get in if um, they had skills that were needed. Um, so for the past hundred years, immigration policy was always tweaked. Um, there was a period where I believe in the 1950s where they were turning back Chinese immigrants um, and Chinese immigrants were coming through the Canadian border and they would renew it. Actually, it wasn't the 1950s. It was the late 1890s. I take that back. So um, immigration policy has always been tweaked. We have never seen anything like we have currently been experiencing just a wide open border with no criteria, people from 155 different countries coming in. This is, uh, this is just totally unacceptable to the American people. Now, H-1B, I am not an immigration expert, but I know, um, oh, and mind you, my ancestors came over. They came through Ellis Island, and when they got here, they ended up going into Pennsylvania, and they were working in the mines and the steel mills. It was not pleasant work but they were hardworking people and they found their way. So it's not, what I'm saying is not anti-immigrant because I came from an immigrant family, most people did. But what we start, started seeing happening, um, let me think, it was probably about 10 or 15 years ago were, well, let me back up more. Um, in the um, Clinton administration at the end of the 1990s, they started promoting a more global society, and they were encouraging companies to move their manufacturing businesses overseas. And they would profess that we were becoming a service society. Now, I came to realize what's been happening for the past 20 years is when we started becoming a dominant service society was when interest rates were drastically lowered and we started printing money and, and buying up bonds. And I think that was to put a floor in to try and support economic development because our country grew based on manufacturing and techno technological developments, not strictly service-based. And I think when you, when you look around at our economy and you start seeing multiple news channels 24 hours a day and most of them don't say anything of value they spew hatred, they spew bad information. I think it's because various entities are looking for a way to, to um, circulate dollars, okay? And you look at the number of services that are out in society. For some reason, they've convinced people that they can't live without all these automated things in their house or people delivering your food. So people no longer have to live a life. You rely on services, okay? So let's go back to H-1B. 
um, there were many people in this country who were looking for better jobs. They wanted to get into better careers. Well, when Bill Clinton started pushing service society issues, um, they started pushing four-year colleges and got away from technical schools because people didn't no longer need those technical skills like we used to because we were pushing most of our factories overseas. In other words, we were enticing corporations to go follow cheap labor. All right, so now all of a sudden, the vast majority of students that went to college were getting four-year degrees and many of them were not useful degrees, okay? So now you've got yourself caught up in the service society. Um, all of a sudden, the housing prices are going up, the stock market is going up, except when there was increased debt like when we went into the Iraq war around 2003, it was greater debt and all of a sudden we went into a recession, okay? There were certain things that triggered it that a service society could not bear the debt, the increased debt, and there would be a correction. Well, what we started seeing were companies like Disney. They started firing their own employees and they started increasing, taking advantage of the H-1B uh, program and they were hiring a lot of cheap labor from overseas to bring them into the country. Well, American citizens were getting very angry about these large corporations that were starting to do that. The tech, tech um, industry started doing it in Silicon Valley and up in Seattle. Microsoft started doing it. Now, do we have anything against talented foreigners to come in? No, but the fact is there were many people in this country who had the talent coming out of schools and they couldn't get those same jobs. And these tech companies were probably giving you a lower salary than an American would get because it was part of the H-1B program. So you were being taken advantage of. They were making out even though they stayed stateside and they brought you over. So there's a real confluence of issues here that are going on. And yet our legislatures are not constructively dealing with it and now we've got this mass immigration coming in that's totally uncontrolled. Um, actually, last month, um, they brought in 221,000 people across the border that went past border security. And that does not count the ones that went undetected. 221,000. And if the rate, this rate continues by the end of this term, this administration's term, 20% of the American population will be in illegal Im immigrants. And that's yes. just my, mind boggling. So you have a confluence of issues going on here. So it's not just H-1B bringing in talented people to find jobs, but dis displacing Americans. Now we've got a lot of illegals coming in. They're being put in small towns and communities. They're gonna be overcrowding schools and it's an absolute mess and it's totally um, irresponsible. Barbara, I must admit, by far, this has been the most comprehensive immigration discussion I've had in conversations that count. Uh, I think the last five minutes have, uh, I, I, I always understood why the immigration was quite high during Clinton era. I also understood why Americans were getting frustrated. It has nothing to do with anti-immigration sentiment. It has to do with the, uh, the abundance of illegal immigration that was happening. And uh, again, I think you connected very well of why we lost that in touch with vocational schools and we, why we got into this four year degree and useless degree. Some of them are useless degrees. I would love to bring you on just an immigration panel to talk about this immigration because more often than not, Barbara, Republicans come across as anti-immigrants. And I tell immigrants saying that not at all. In fact, they are really thinking it through. We all understand that at one point, our parents, grandparents, or ourselves were immigrants. We just really need to fix the issue. In order to fix the issue, we need to understand how did it get started? What happened in 1950? What happened in Clinton era? What happened in uh, Biden, which is a complete illegal immigration, which is a whole different story. But what policies did Clinton and George Bush follow through that really led us to this? But I would love to bring you back into one of the immigration panel. I think you definitely have very good insights on that. Well, two other points I'd like to make. Um, one is, the nations that are sending up a, a significant number or a significant number is leaving the countries like from Central America. 
these countries are still receiving foreign aid from the United States. Foreign aid that was supposed to help with employment training and various other things. There, um, I believe it's Ecuador who has told the United States, don't send anybody back because we're not taking them. Now, can you imagine a country saying that they won't take their citizens back if we send them back? That, that is just unthinkable to me. Um, the other point uh, that I was going to make, um, escape me right now. <laughs> no worries, no worries. I think, uh, I think you made a good point where countries are able to send, I, I'm sure they probably wouldn't have said it in the past president's era. Now they all feel empowered and emboldened to take United States for granted. So, oh, the, oh, yeah. the second, I'm sorry. The second thing was how endangered many of these people have become because we've got um, drug, drugs uh, coming across. Um, China told the United States that they would not send fentanyl into the United States, but they're doing it through Mexico and it's coming in through Mexico. Um, and so we have a lot of sex trafficked and many of the, the young women are getting raped en route. And so um, this whole process, you have to ask, what's the intent of opening the gates, being disrespectful and disregarding the immigrants' safety disregarding American citizens' safety, and they're gonna do what they're gonna do. And it's, it's uncontrollable and um, it just has to be reckoned with. And it has to be reckoned with by the voters in November. And unfortunately, that's too much time, but that's all we can do is wait until the next election. Barbara, I so wish a lot of immigrants are watching this so they kind of understand where you're coming from your perspective. And also you kind of talked about some of the things that you can actually do to kind of alleviate this issue. So now I would love to move on to fiscal house. I think on your website, you had eloquently wrote about how to get our fiscal house in order. I, uh, I say more often than not, Barbara, when I look at candidates' website, they, they eloquently talk about the problems, uh, but really not the solution. Sometimes it's good to bulletin point and say, these are the three solutions I propose for immigration reform. And that might not be the solutions, spot on when you actually become elected, but it's also a nice to know what are the solutions, right? So, right. but I, I really enjoyed your website where you had a couple of solutions for each of the problems. So one of your proposals is for the government to, per, to pursue, to inform the American public quarterly on the US debt to GDP ratio. I think that should be part of not only the quarterly report, but in fact, it should be the state of the union address. I think during every state of the union address, we need to talk about what U.S. debt is and what is our G U.S. debt to actually GDP ratio. Can you elaborate to viewers about your vision on how to get this fiscal house in order? Well, first of all, we need to start stop all this reckless spending. Um, take, for example, the infrastructure bill that was just passed. It was $1.2 trillion, but only 10% of it, about 120 trillion or slightly less, uh, 120 million, is going for infrastructure. The rest are pet projects or redistribution. We're actually taking people's taxed hard-earned incomes and giving it away to other people. Now, in America, we believe on individualism and self-sufficiency. So people came over as immigrants, they found a job, they took care of their family, and they were happy with what they earned. But now the government is actually taking our earned income and deciding to give it away. For example, the Ill illegal immigrants coming across the border. The government is actually um, taking buildings and moving people out of them um, and either leasing or buying buildings in LA and Seattle and putting the illegals in. They're giving them health care. They're giving them money for food. And it's like, what is going on? They're also redistributing it throughout society, throughout the American population. And there's no work requirements. They're actually paying people not to work. They Now, we were dealing with COVID, and some people lost their jobs, especially in small businesses. But small businesses create 65% of the new jobs every year. And they spend uh, about 20 to 25% of their income on taxes. So 
what we have is now the government, this administration is paying people not to go to work. Now, when, when a lot of small businesses are having to close their doors, small businesses can't get loans to keep their doors open, and then you have the government paying people not to go back, what do you think is going to happen to the vast majority of small business in this country? Most people, I mean, how many people work for gigantic global corporations? I don't know the exact number. The vast majority of people work for small businesses, which tells you why is our government trying to destroy the independent entrepreneur who works hard, puts in 18 hours a day, working seven days a week to earn profits, to, to have a family and support themselves, and they're destroying it. Why are they doing this to our nation? It's Absolutely. somebody needs to explain. And when I look at the um, GDP to deficit ratio or um, GDP to debt ratio, if you look back historically, it was, it was actually um, back, it did not reach uh, 50% in 1939 when the depression ended it was only at 59% what our debt was to GDP, okay? And it hit 100% at the end of World War II because of all of our expenses from the war. And then it started going down. And in 1950, it bounced back up to about 71%. And then it actually went down to the 40%. And it stayed in those low levels um, until the late 1980s. And the federal government started raising taxes and it hit 50% again. But really for the most part, our debt to GDP was staying around 50% until we got into the 1990s, the Clinton administration, mm -hmm. all right? And it was the Clinton budgets and the welfare reform. Now he did add work requirements to receiving welfare, but, um, they, then in around 2000, we had the war on terror. So all of a sudden, the per percentage of debt to GDP was climbing. And we finally hit 90% in 2010. Obama was in office and there was a lot of, they, they did um, the um, Obamacare was passed around that time, 2012. And we finally hit 100% in 2014. So really it's been since the 1990s, we hit 90%, finally hit 100% in 2015, and we are now at around 125%. Um, you don't see numbers, co countries like uh, an advanced nation like ours, spending more than what they bring in, what they earn in GDP and production. And you have to say, well, then what is causing that? And they keep spending. They're using COVID now as another excuse for more COVID money. And all they're doing is redistributing it because they That's have enough. a goal. They have a goal to change our country, to get away from individualism and to have more government control. And that's why you see a struggle with freedom of speech. Um, small businesses are having a difficult time getting loans because of these, this transformation that Obama and Biden had been talking about now for 10 years. And also, Barbara, I think you spoke very well about the national debt, but just kind of talking even about Fairfax County, myself and our chairman, Steve Knotts, were at a board of supervisors meeting where I questioned them saying that you have $80 million set aside with no line items. So why are you increasing taxes on us, right? So it starts at local level. That's why I think it's very important that we elect a congressman that uh, congressmen and congresswomen that are able to make our board of supervisors uh, accountable for what they're spending and why they're spending as much as they're spending. I think as um, a fiscally responsible mom, I teach my kids uh, that a dollar spent is dollar gone for life, right? So if you, if you don't make, uh, you spend within your means. I so wish our government would adopt that. But uh, Barbara, let me talk to you now. Uh, we are almost in the post-pandemic world. Uh, you touched a little bit in your discussion about economic growth and taxes. 
Um, so do you think decreasing corporate taxes will result in economic growth? Well, here's, here's the issue that we have. The only way to really pay down the debt is through economic growth. Well, how do we grow the economy with such massive debt? We not only have over 100% of debt in the national um, uh, treasury books, but corporations are sitting on massive debt because they got used to lower interest rates. Homeowners are sitting on a lot of debt because people um, charged a lot of things. So there's a lot of personal debt, a lot of corporate debt, and a lot of national debt. And now we hit the COVID environment and a lot of companies were shut down for you know months. People learned to work from home. So um, I would say probably around 60% of the population was still working, but small businesses got hit very hard. So now we've got this debt and the Federal Reserve has to unwind all of this debt. The reason why is because we cannot keep spending at the rate we are for risk of losing our reserve currency. It's the, the ability of the dollar to be used in the global economy as a reserve currency that other countries use at a, as a common exchange that enables us to print money and to sell bonds. So if we are not able to pay back our debt with this reckless spending, and China is growing and saying they're going to take the lead, not by 2050, like their 100-year plan talks about, but by 2030, that it will jeopardize, jeopardize our ability to be a reserve currency, and we will not be able to run up our debt the way we have. And we will not have grown our economy enough to handle our debt, and it's all jeopardized. So the Federal Reserve now is talking about possibly raising interest rates um, 0.75% um, in June, and in May, possibly 0.5%. And when it rises that fast, it's a matter of how does the economy adjust? Absolutely, Barbara. I think, um, I, I wish, I always say once you speak in the video, it lives there forever. Um, I don't want anything that you said to come true but I wouldn't be surprised if communist China continued to grow. And in 10 years, we're looking back at this video and it's like, wow, we predicted this. And um, so that's, that's kind of devastating. Um, Barbara, I, I wanna kind of move on to something that you stated on your website and it wasn't very clear to me, it could be me, but I thought a lot of our viewers when they're deciding about candidates do go into the website, kind of read about the issues. So I wanted uh, to get some clarification from you. Uh, you said something of that nature saying that I support the improvement of our military posture by supporting a peace through strength approach. I think hypothetically I understand, but can you elaborate a bit on that? So oh, um, Ronald Reagan, President Reagan talked about peace through strength in the 1980s. And the, the philosophy behind that was to build up a military that had um, super capabilities, very strong military posture so that it could handle two wars on two different fronts at the same time. And if you were strong enough, then no other nation would um, uh, attempt to uh, engage in war or threaten the United States. So that is peace through strength. The stronger you are, the more peace there will be because nobody will attempt to challenge you. Yeah. And, um, and right now, what we've been seeing since the Obama administration is the defense budget has been cut. It has been cut progressively. Um, I believe that all federal bureaucracy needs to clean out the waste and the fraud in their acquisition programs, and I believe the Defense Department needs to do that too. But our military posture has been degrading. There's a study out there done, done by the Heritage Foundation on our military posture, and um, they go through all four services, um, the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marine Corps, and they have them weakening weakening it is a weakening trend that we have been experiencing and it's not good um, because of the um, relocation of resources 
into other programs, more domestic programs at the expense of our military posture. Great. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you for clarifying. On the same token, you also talked about initiating legislation for civil service reform. Can you also elaborate on that? Yes. I worked in the civil government or civil service um, uh, for 25 years. And um, just like the defense issue that I mentioned, many legislatures have never uh, been in the military. Um, the same thing for civil service. They have never worked in the bureaucracies. They've come in as lawyers. We have so many lawyers on Capitol Hill. We have businessmen, but we don't have anyone that has really had a career in civil service. The civil service or all the agencies are based on an, um, an autocratic structure, hierarchy, okay? And the policies come from the top down. And what you have are layers and layers of management. And the only way to change out management is if somebody decides to get a new job or um, they retire or possibly a senior leader moves them. But for the most part, management can get stale. They're always looking up to please their, their supervisors above them. There is so much talent in the, in the uh, lower levels of the bureaucracy and they don't get face time every day at the, at the daily meetings. What I would like to see are drastic changes to empower federal bureau bureaucrats to not only be able to um, nominate periodically people who should be in the management roles and it should do, be done frequently like every two years or something like that to improve the performance, to incentivize bureaucrats that there are openings for them. It also, um, behooves managers that take people who work for them for granted. And some people are not necessarily treated very well because they are taken for granted. Um, managers don't necessarily keep current in their functional areas. And so new ideas that percolate from the bottom end up going to meetings and the managers take credit for these ideas. It is not right. And so what we need to incentivize bureaucrats to be more creative now, this also gets back to the budget. Um, bureaucracies have always believed that if they turn back money to the treasury at the end of the year, that they will not get as much money the next year. So mm -hmm. there's this game that goes on. Oh, we can't turn anything in. That's why you see roads repeatedly paved over saying, this road was just paved over three years ago. Why is it being paved again? It even goes down to the local levels. They will not turn money in. So we need to incentivize bureaucrats to do the hard right thing, to identify where the waste is, and there is waste. There are programs that are not very significant that are still on the books. We have contractors manning, manning them. You know, we, are, we have so many contractors and federal employees in this district, but while they don't want to see jobs reduced, they also don't want to see their dollars reduced. But something's got to give because they're, they're part of the problem because they won't identify a way of making the government more efficient. We could take the same amount of money and probably produce twice as many programs or at least 50% more programs and have a lot more um, interesting work environment for bureaucrats if we just improve the way we spent money. And so we have to build this into the bureaucracy. And Jerry Conley has been in this district for 14 years, and he hasn't done a thing for the bureaucrats other than suggest a pay increase, you know, or saying that we have more than one CIOs in the agencies to be our technical advisors. We need to only have one to give them the power to make decisions. He doesn't know the bureaucracy. He doesn't know how bureaucrat, bureaucratic work functions. And so we need to change. We need so to Barbara, change. this bureaucracy uh, is not only happening right now in federal government, it's unfortunately the base stage of talent is happening in corporate organizations, probably to a lesser extent than why uh, than it's happening in federal world, but it's happening in all walks of American life, uh, which is kind of pretty sad. I mean, if you think about it, there is such a young talent, uh, budding talent 
and they kind of get stagnated. I'm glad you brought up Connolly, uh, Jerry Connolly. Um, so Barbara, the most promising method of securing your virtuous people is to elect virtual, virtuous leaders. Here, here we have been electing Connolly for decades at this point. He was a supervisor. Uh, he got into House of Representatives and so on and so forth. So have you checked on Connolly's voting records? Uh, I do that very frequently. I check on his, uh, not only voting records, I even, in fact, look at his VPAP to see who are his biggest donors. Because sometimes I think follow the money, you'll know where the policies are coming from. Uh, I think my question to you is, what do you think stand out on uh, when, uh, when you see his voting records that you feel like I absolutely would vote differently? What do you think of that? Well, he just all of a sudden has gotten active by co-sponsoring five pieces of legislation for women. So obviously he's targeting women voters. And those five pieces of legislation center around abortion. And he has always supported a woman's right of choice. Um, and one of the, the co-sponsored uh, pieces of legislation is to standardize abortion law across the 50 states. Another one is to make more available contraceptives in all pharmaceuticals. Now, I can't imagine what pharmaceutical doesn't provide on the shelf contraceptives that's not available to anyone that walks through the door. So what mm -hmm. kind of meaningless legislation was that? I don't know. But again, he's catering to the women vote and uh, giving the appearance that he, he favors them to have choice. And what I see is I find it very derogatory because women from the, for the past 20 years has been led by um, Hollywood to watch movies so that you go out on a date and guess where you end up at the end of the night. And this has been so common that women just and men take the risk and we end up having increased abortions and in fact, uh, significantly higher levels of divorce rates over the past 20 and 30 years. And what I have seen is the fact that um, I have seen dating websites where men aren't shy about admitting that they're agnostic or atheists. Um, I don't know about you, but I would not be entertained to attempt to get to know somebody who advertises they're an atheist. Um, but the, um, the fact that Conley wants to make more acceptable contraceptives while at the same time he's promoting women's right to choose and trying to standardize laws for abortions is contradictory to me. If you want to um, encourage women to not take, take risk and to value their ability to reproduce and have a family, I think that's sending the wrong message. And I don't support it. I'm pro-life. I've been married for a number of decades now uh, to a wonderful man. Um, and I can't think of any way to lead a happier life than to have someone that you're married to and that you enjoy, that you have little conflict with, and that you've actually had uh, the opportunity to have a family. Absolutely, Barbara, I, ca I can't uh, agree with you more. So in a time where we are told men can be women, <laughs> scientific facts are anti-science and the tyrannical restriction of freedom is for public safety, right? All this is happening right now. I couldn't have believed uh, all of this if you said will happen in United States of America five years back. So tell me, Barbara, how do we think we restore critical thinking and rationality among 11th district voters. I mean, how do you think we can bring it to their attention? The conversations like this are great. Going, doing the outreach is great. But at the end of the day, in a broader scale, how do, we, uh, how do you think we can restore critical thinking? Well, you know, the way I look at it, um, I have a public policy degree. And I, now that I'm going into politics, have looked at having pillars. And my three pillars are God, family, and country. When I think of God, I think of how our nation was created. Our founding fathers believed in God and believed that we have 
inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, pursuit of happiness was basically to work hard and to have um, possessions, to have property. And in the process, um, uh, our founding fathers also believed in natural law, which meant that people were, were born, but we were never equal, ever equal. We are a generic human being, but some people may have more nerve endings in their brain than others, so, which makes them think faster. So therefore, when they go to school, they do better if they want to work hard. Everybody is different. And the Founding Fathers also believe that you cannot have liberty if you are pushing equal outcomes. Because if each individual is trying to develop themselves based on their capabilities, we're all going to be different. So liberty cannot survive if you're pushing equal outcomes. And so I look at some of the policies that are coming down from the schools. They are um, reducing the number of advanced placement courses that students can have access to in high school. They're doing away with grades. I don't see it as an attempt to help students as opposed to it's a power control. It's a matter of controlling society. They don't really care how people develop themselves. They're not concerned that a large number of kids are graduating from high school and can barely read at the third grade level. They don't care. This is a power thing. So let me back up. When it comes to social issues about um, trans genders, um, male thinking that he's a female, it appears that females now are bearing the burden of dealing with this issue. Again, why are women being, being uh, strapped with this issue? And my philosophy is that person, like all of us, were born with the DNA from two parents, a mother and a father. And that's the way they were born. And for the government to discriminate and select out that one particular group, to me, is very destabilizing for society. And the government knows it. Because how many children who were born with Down syndrome or who were born without limbs, um, has the government stepped forward and said, we will pay for your medical bills to, make, to bring you back up to normal or bring you back so you look like everyone else? They don't. So why are they doing it for the transgen community, especially the guy who thinks he's a woman? Now, some states are passing laws that say you are the sex that is listed on your birth certificate. And some people are having a fit. I don't know how legislators are going to deal with this, but it's a state issue. And so not only is the federal government trying to federalize our voting process and, and allow ballots to be flown, thrown around in the mail and everything's for an un, another uncontrolled scene in upcoming elections, but they're also trying to take powers from the states. And that's one thing our founding fathers thrived on. They made three branches of government, the executive, the legislative, and the judicial. And they made sure that none of them overpowered any other. But the one thing that the founding fathers didn't talk much about were executive orders. Executive orders have always been interpreted to mean that the executive in the White House is implementing something that was passed legally by Congress and that they would tweak it or something, not to come out with policies out of their hat, spending lots of money to redistribute or reckless waste and do things erratically like we have been experiencing. This is totally not something that our founding fathers ever anticipated. Also, they made sure there was a check between the federal government and states' rights. And the federal government is trying to pull things from the states and put it into the central government. And they're also trying to build the bureaucracies so huge. And right now we've been seeing policies where bureaucrats, various agencies have been turning against the public. The public is what gives the bureaucrats and the government their authority to function. They also give them their tax dollars. How can you turn the uh, Homeland Security against the people? How can you turn the education department and the justice department against parents because parents want to be involved with their students? 
How can you turn, you know, it just goes on. Um, how can you turn Health and Human Services, which is CDC is part of, they ignored all the studies about COVID. They came out with a policy and sent it to the, the teachers union. The teachers union changed it because they wanted to close schools down and that's what CDC published. So our government is actually turning against the people uh, to a certain degree. And we've got to recognize it and nobody will put it in those terms. I've heard it a few times on TV about weaponizing the government. And, uh, but we've got to deal with this and we've got to deal with it fast. I see the circumstance that we're in right now is like a hurricane. You go through one side of the hurricane, which was last year, and now things are calm because we're going into the election. But if the Republicans don't take the majority on the Hill to change what's going on, we are gonna be facing two years of that, the backside of the storm. And I can't imagine what it would be like. And Barbara, two years is, is, still, is going to be a long two years for us. I mean, to see, I mean, what, uh, if you can only imagine what happened in the last two years, you can predict the future of the next two years. Yes. So, Barbara, you very eloquently explained the correlation between CDC, Health and Human Services, and so on and so forth. Hey, I was curious to know, I mean, at least as an immigrant, and I think this is true for everyone, you spoke a little bit about education, you spoke a little bit about parental control. Um, education is uh, paramount, at least for me, and it is critical for upward mobility. I say that one of the reasons I sustained in this new culture is because of the education that I received. Mm -hmm. I didn't see that you picked education as one of the issues. I was just curious to know your uh, take on uh, education. Also wanted to know, do you think education will play a great role in this election too? Like it did in November, 2021, it just changed the entire dynamics of uh, 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 Yankin election. So what's your take on that, Barbara? Um, in 2021, we were still dealing with the pandemic. People were wearing masks and they were starting to um, be more social and come out. and. The education issue percolated because of what was happening in Leesburg. Um, it's not that I don't find education or the right to life important. Um, I was trying to think of main issues that had a profound impact, not just in our district, but nationwide, because right now our nation is facing some really critical challenges. And so that's what I focused on, um, especially based on my background, having been in the military, um, having studied government and public affairs, I think nationally. I don't think so much local issues about paving roads, putting up street lights and traffic lights. I think in terms of um, our military posture, our economy, and especially now that I have a finance degree and I think of capital investments, um, I was really taken back when I heard that Secretary Yellen who used to be the um, FEC chair, the Federal Reserve chair, um, as treasury secretary, she was going and visiting big banks and telling them not to loan money to the gas and oil industry Ooh. to help to suppress the energy industry. Also that alternative energy could, could uh, uh, percolate. And I have traveled extensively in Europe and I have seen fields of solar panels and fields of, excuse me, that's, a, that's my husband's phone, um, and seen fields of um, 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 That's okay, you were just talking about where you saw The fact is they are still importing energy from Russia, oil and gas, and um, uh, they cannot survive without fossil fuel use. And that's no different here. Yet they are suppressing our industry, our energy industry, which we finally became energy independent. Yep. And, and now we're putting all this money and raising the debt more, jeopardizing our status in the global economy and risking, oh, excuse me. That's okay. Um, risking our um, reserve currency in the process, dealing with um, China. And so now the Ukrainian situation has happened and it's very frustrating for civilians here in this country 
to find out that our country should have been giving them weapons over a year ago and that they were dragging their feet. Possibly, there's projections that it was possibly to help Putin. Um, I don't know. I have nothing to go by. But it is suspect that now we're watching a nation of hardworking people, loving people, people coming in from all kinds of countries wanting to help defend them. And uh, people leaving, but they're anxious to go back in and build up their country. Yet we have people coming in from 155 nations who don't wanna go back to their homeland. They yeah. don't wanna fight their government. They don't wanna build up their country. And yet we watch the Ukrainian example and we're astounded by their bravery. Absolutely. God bless them. So uh, Barbara, we are coming to the end of this. I think you eloquently spoke about all the issues and I'm glad you're focusing on national platform because if you are the elected Congresswoman, your role will be much more critical on the national platform than the local roads paving and so on and so forth. So Barbara, in, in order to take on Jerry Connolly, we all know that endorsement play a big role. Um, having a name recognition plays a big role and raising money plays a big role. So I was just kind of uh, wondering, how is your candidacy going? Are you getting a good uh, gravity within our communities about not only endorsement, but raising money and all of that good stuff? Well, I have um, been door knocking. Um, I have been well received, um, especially by veterans groups uh, and women's groups. Um, as long as they're not Democratic women, um, for the most part, because many of them are, are really sticking to their guns. But if they have children in school, they're willing to change their minds. As far as raising money, I have decided not to raise money right now until the nomination process is over. Um, I don't feel comfortable raising money if I don't get selected. Sure. And I have decided to bear the burden of the expenses. And if I'm nominated, I will be going full force, uh, getting a consultant and starting to raise money. I know how important fundraising is. And um, Jerry uh, Conley has a large war chest. Um, he has uh, been uh, taking advantage of having uh, no challenges for many years. Um, uh, the last go around, a manga challenged him but uh, it still was a struggle. But now that we've been redistrict um, and our economy uh, is facing a lot of challenges and we have challenges from this current administration, the environment is so totally different. So I look forward to, if I receive the nomination, working really hard to beat Jerry Conley in November. No, thank you for strategizing because it's always nice to know that what is candidate thinking when it comes to raising money. As we know, he does have a big war chest. He does. So, yep. <laughs> um, I think uh, that, that's the advantage of being a career politician. So yes. that, that's who we are trying to beat. So Barbara, we are at the tail end of the program. Uh, I would love to get your perspective on anything that I missed out. Sometimes I feel like I'm asking questions that uh, I know 11th congressional constituents like to hear. I'm also asking questions that are my personal passion like immigration reform and stuff, but uh, I don't want to dismiss the fact that, uh, that you may have something that you wanna tell your viewers in the last two minutes. Uh, what, mm -hmm. did, what did I miss and what would you like to tell our viewers? I think, um... If you know anything about me, what you need to understand is I love learning. And I could never ask enough questions, even when I was in high school. I learned how to play football, basketball, and baseball by watching TV with my father. Um, I learned a lot by asking questions. And I don't hesitate to share information. And I feel that many voters are so busy with their day-to-day -day life, earning a living, raising a family, being on social media, that they're not spending enough time to understand what the issues are and what candidates are about. So therefore it's easy to fall back on um, th their old habits. And if you were a Democrat once, you will be a Democrat again um, and not really understanding. But I think the situation now in the economy and in the schools have gotten serious enough that people are st starting to pay closer attention. Um, what you'll find on my website is I like to refer back to the founding fathers of what this country was intended to be, because if we lose sight of what those values were, um, we're not gonna be able to keep it. 
uh, there are too many radical things going on. And I subscribe that to um, a global economy where now we've got a ruling class, not just of the wealthy, but it's worldwide. Uh, governments all around the world are messing with our elections. Why did we have servers overseas for our elections? Um, these things need to be explained. We need to understand where this foreign money is coming from. We need to understand why Biden, the Biden family is so messed up with a lot of foreign influence. The Clinton family also was, was taking influence um, from foreign nations. And so therefore, if people don't understand their roots and establish values and stand up for them and select the right candidates to fight for us, it's going to be a down, downward trend that we're facing. And we cannot afford to lose our reserve currency. Um, you will mention, you even probably caught Biden's comment a couple of weeks ago. He said, we are entering a new um, global posture and the United States needs to make sure that we're leading it. Well, if we're doing some of the things that we're doing and Russia and China are forming an alliance and bringing in Iran, then how is it the United States is going to continue to lead this new world um, economy? So that's our challenge. Absolutely. On that note, Barbara, I also want to let our uh, viewers know that on your website, you have listed all 28 constitutional beliefs, which I read line by line. I think that's mm -hmm. pretty neat and a lot of people need to go in and see that. And uh, um, Barbara, one more point you made is once you're a Democrat, you're a Democrat. Once you're a Republican, you're a Republican. That is changing. You're 100% accurate on that. I, before the conversations that count this evening, I attended an Afghan event in support of our Afghan women that are struggling there. And uh, one of the speaker that came there, I want to go into her names because she wasn't appointed just to maintain her privacy. She was appointed as a big head in uh, Obama era. And she says she's never going to vote for Democrat ever again. She says she still inclines very much uh, on Democrat side on some of the social issue, but not the extent of social issues that are happening right now, but definitely on a security front and uh, national border security. She is like, I'll never vote a Democrat ever again. So I think people are changing, you're right. I think with all the things that are going on with the economy, with our security borders issue, with parental rights issue, with regards to education, I think we we definitely have winners. And uh, I mean, you uh, all the candidates are so um, so very amazing. You have very unique skill set with your military and navy background. So I can't wait for you to. Uh, be uh, as our final contender. I say this to all our candidates. I think all of them are worth and need to get to the next uh, level, but may the best win. So that being said, Barbara, I thank you for your time. I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation and loved learning about your background. I wish you the very best. And thank I look you. forward to working with any 11th Congressional District primary winners. I've, um, I, after redistricting, I live right now in 11th Congressional District. So now I have vested interest in getting the very best candidate to face off with Connolly. And I'm here to support and we are here to support. So thank you for joining us this evening. Thank so you. View, thank you. Viewers, let's all join together. So uh, together we can take back control of our House of Representatives and change the tide that has swept our nation this past year. I look forward to seeing all of you on May 7th so you can vote for one of these wonderful candidates. Tomorrow evening at 7 p.m. on Conversations That Count, I will have Kezia Tunnel. Kezia is running for uh, Congressional District Number 8. And on Sunday, I'm going to have Judge uh, Jim Miles, who is also running for 11th Congressional District. Please tune in to get to know the candidates. Uh, I really uh, hope you all will take the time to look at their websites, look at these conversations that count, uh, spread the news, please share the video. The video will be on Fairfax GOP, but unless it gets shared, not many people will get to hear these candidates. Uh, I mean, as you see, the candidates have brilliant views and they're, very, they're patriotic. They really wanna make the change happen. They're putting their time, talent and money out there to win these primaries. So I hope you decide to 
like this video, put some comments in, uh, be candid, share the video, talk to your friends, and come out on uh, May 7th and vote for one of these candidates. Thank you for your support and have a wonderful evening, you all. God bless you and your families and God bless this beautiful Commonwealth and our great nation.